This is a video game. The name of this video game is Rogue, and it is being played by a YouTuber named Scott Manley. Now when you see this, I know what you're thinking. Wow, this is a ripoff of the 2018 indie hit Hades, but that is stupid, and you are stupid, so allow me to educate you. Rogue is a 1980 adventure game with two major mechanics, random level generation, so the game will be different on every playthrough, and permadeath, so when you die in the game, you die in the game, and it's back to square one. These two mechanics have become fairly popular in the indie sphere, and games that mimic these attributes are referred to as roguelikes because they're dirty thieves and can't come up with their own ideas. A similar story can be heard from the Metroidvania boom, from any games that all want to mimic Metroid and Castlevania, and some people have been questioning whether there has been enough representation to justify a Souls-like genre as well. I'm here today to ignore that inquiry, and instead answer the question nobody is asking. What about a mother-like genre? So strap in, kids, as I, Miss Frizzle, take you on an over-the-top and wholly unnecessary journey to review the mother games, and the games that want to be your mother as well. Okay, first off, let's talk about Mother 1 and Mother 2, but please bear with me, this is going to be the longest review I'm going to do today, as I have two games to cover, and I also have to lay down the groundwork for what exactly a mother-like genre is. Mother 1 was developed by Shigesato Itoi and was released for the NES in 1987, but it never actually came to America. Mother 2 was released for the SNES in 1994, and it did come to America, but under the name of Earthbound. English fans started to refer to Mother 1 as Earthbound Zero until it was officially localized in 2015 under the name of Earthbound Beginnings, and it gets really messy with all the names, and so just to keep things more simple, I'm only going to be referring to Mother 1 as Mother 1 and Mother 2 as Mother 2. Both games, Mother 1 and Mother 2, were very well known for their really goofy aesthetic. And a really good example to showcase this is the kind of enemies that you, you fight in both Mother games. You fight things such as a, a household lamp, you fight cops, you fight hippies from down the street, you fight the KKK themselves, you fight UFOs with tutus, there's crows that smoke and it goes on and on and on, and they like to do things like flash a brilliant smile that's so brilliant you are unable to stop crying. That's not an exaggeration, that's an actual status effect can't stop crying. Mother 2 actually sports my favorite status effect in video game history, that being homesickness, which causes Ness to be unable to act some turns until you find a phone and call your mom. The music of the Mother series also does a lot to set the tone of the series as well. You've got goofy songs like the shop theme called Buy Something Will Ya. You also have got the battle themes. And then the inspirational heartfelt bops like Pollyanna and Annette. The gameplay of Mother Tube is the weakest aspect, but it, it can be fun at times. HP scrolling means that your HP doesn't drop immediately when you take damage, but rather it slowly scrolls, which means that you can survive otherwise fatal hits by mashing through text fast enough. It adds a level of panic and haste that is usually completely absent from games like this. This feature is not present in Mother 1 though, and it does make the game feel a little bit lacking on the gameplay front. These games are also old, and so they fall prey to old game syndrome, where the developers want the player to go to one certain spot and do one certain thing, but they don't do a very good job communicating to the player what that one thing is. Mother 2 isn't too bad about it, but Mother 1 is, and it kind of bogs these games down a little bit. On the other hand, the story of these games kind of makes it worth it, since the shenanigans are so fun, and rather than searching the land for 8 magic MacGuffins to access the demon castle, instead you find 8 separate measures of a song and piece them together, which, in Mother 1, the songs are found from various objects and animals and are then used to lull a giant evil alien to sleep before he lasers you to death. Unfortunately, this is where we get to the sad part of the story. Mother 2 sales figures were not good, although a decent amount of this blame goes to Nintendo, who tried to advertise the game with a campaign of 
this game's gross with foul-smelling stickers, which is only going to attract seven-year-old boys that are either too poor to get the game or too stupid to appreciate what this game actually had to offer. The only real reason anybody really knows what Mother is is because Ness appeared in Smash Brothers, which is a shame because these are quality games that do deserve a lot of respect. But because of the way Nintendo advertised them, nobody wanted to give up the time of day. Mother 3, spoilers, is probably the best game on this list, although I'll get back to that later. But if you thought Nintendo did a bad job localizing Mother 2, well, I mean, at least we got the flipping game. Mother 3 released for the Game Boy Advance in 2006, and Nintendo has openly ignored all demand for localization of the game. And honestly, when it comes to Mother 3 and its localization, or rather the lack thereof, there's so much to unpack that we'd be here all day. And the YouTuber Neryl has already made a fantastic video about that subject, go check that out. TLDR, if you can acquire just a Japanese copy of the game, there are very quality fan-made patches out there that are made by professional translators. Right off the bat, Mother 3 inherits everything that made Mother 1 and Mother 2 so great. But this time around, Itoi has a much more profound and sad story to tell. Don't misunderstand, the game still finds every opportunity that it can to tell a joke. It is a very funny game, but what's so impressive is the way that Itoi is able to juggle these emotions. The game goes places I had never seen a game go before, and at the same time, the game never really takes itself too seriously. It's a fine line, and Mother 3 dances it like it's the Mamushka. Mamushka! Mamushka! He comes with Mamushka! Gameplay-wise, Mother 3 brings back the HP scrolling mechanic introduced to Mother 2, but it also introduces a new mechanic of enemy heartbeats that match the rhythm of the music. By matching the heartbeat, the player can create combos and deal more damage, but as the game progresses, the enemy heartbeats get more radical, and the time signatures of the music get more ridiculous. <laughs> As much as I love to praise this game though, there are a couple flaws to note. For one, there's a couple difficulty spikes in the game that just require the player to run around and grind just to be able to continue the story. For another, as amazing as the soundtrack is, unfortunately because it released on the Game Boy Advance, all of the sound files are really really compressed because they had to compete for time on the system. This leaves all of the tracks sounding pretty grainy. <laughs> Nitpicks aside though, this is a fantastic game. It's gorgeous, it's depressing, it's sad, it's hilarious, and it's a dadgum shame that we can't buy this game legally outside of Japan. Come on, Reggie, give us Mother 3! How about this instead? I really don't need to talk about Undertale for that long. It's easily the most popular game on this list, and for good reason. The game is fun, it's dynamic, and it's very replayable. It's pretty common knowledge that Toby Fox was a big fan of Earthbound, and Megalovania was originally used for a ROM hack that he made. And the inspiration he took from Mother is pretty clear. The zaniness of almost every interaction feels straight from Itoi himself. But in true Mother fashion, the game knows when to slow down and be serious for a moment. And the mood shifts can make each emotional extreme feel that much more potent. The music in Undertale is unanimously praised. So much so that Toby Fox has since been hired by other companies such as Game Freak to write soundtracks or even individual songs for them. Fourth wall breaks are definitely toyed with in each of the Mother games, but never to this extreme. Fourth wall breaks are the mechanic of Undertale. It's not Undertale without them. And while the Mother series puts a couple spins on the traditional turn-based JRPG combat, Undertale chooses to rewrite the rules entirely, transforming combat into something totally unique for the genre. Dodging attacks is much more engaging than just reading text through the whole match, and trying to convince enemies to stand down is really funny. Well until it's not. You fight most enemies repeatedly throughout the game, and if you're aiming for a more pacifist route, the dialogue options do not change, so once you know the answer, 
That's it. Now it's just a matter of picking the right options and dodging, which can definitely get repetitive and boring after a while, and even pretty annoying at some points. Alternatively, if you forego pacifism and aim to murder everything instead, the game doesn't really offer anything in this regard either, combat-wise. Aside from a couple boss fights, every fight boils down to pressing attack, then dodging the counter-attack, and the game lacks any sense of development from start to end in this regard, offering you only one weapon and one armor slot, and no abilities or skills or different attacks to learn to strategize with. Under Undertale is really much more a dodging and waiting game more than anything. Dodge and wait till they die, or dodge and wait till they give up. The art is also pretty subpar. It's not bad, it's just... No, I, I think it's bad. Minor issues aside though, Undertale has far more good to offer than anything, and absolutely deserve the praise that it received on launch. Alright, confession time. I secretly just made this video to promote this game. Well, this and Mother 3, but mostly this, because you can actually acquire this game reasonably. The gameplay of Amori is much closer to a standard, turn-based RPG than Undertale, but with a couple really awesome, unique mechanics to give it that breath of life. Mother had type effectiveness and status effects like any normal JRPG. There were weird status effects like can't stop crying and homesickness, but they fundamentally didn't change the actual gameplay all too much. Omori, on the other hand, combines both status effects and type effectiveness together into one mechanic, the emotion system. So instead of fire beats water or axe beats lance, you have happy beats mad, which is interesting because your emotions are both dynamic as they can change as a result of both your moves and the enemy's moves, but also because they alter your stats as happy units are faster and sad enemies are slower but more defensive and so on. This keeps battles really engaging and dynamic and fun, but unfortunately Omori is also really easy and you never actually really have to take full advantage of any of the tools that the game gives you, but they are fun to play around with anyway. Artistically the game ain't much, or well it ain't much half the time. Most of the game is played in the standard pixel art style, but battles and some cutscenes are hand drawn and they all look fantastic. Similarly to all the games listed previously, Omori goes 1000% into charm with its goofy character interactions and quirky enemy designs and completely off the wall story events and writing. Unlike the previous entries however, Omori also likes to sneak up on you when you have your guard down and quietly remind you that this game has a gun behind its back all along. When it comes to horror, there have been a couple notable moments in the Mother titles. The first two Mother titles have their respective final bosses abruptly flipping the cheery tone of their games on their head. It's big, it's climactic, but at the end of the day that's all they are. A big, sad, scary finale. Omori, on the other hand, likes to wield its horror to regularly aid in its storytelling, and it works. 100% it works. Part of what impressed me so much about Mother 3 is the way that it was able to blend serious and silly so flawlessly to tell a fantastical yet heartfelt story. This is not true for Omori. The opposite is true. Horror and funny don't mix well. You're either laughing or you're scared, never both. And the devs knew that, and they used that to their full advantage. Omori uses both their horror and their humor brilliantly to tell the story they did, and the story absolutely would not have worked without both. Now, let's return to the question at hand. What about a mother-like genre? Well, as both a fan of the series and a boy genius, I'm here to officially declare no. Er, probably not. While these games share similarities, they are mostly just in tone and writing style. Little is common and unique gameplay-wise, and style of gameplay is the most important factor when deciding a game genre. Being funny and quirky is not a gameplay genre. Now, you're probably thinking, wow, so you just wasted my time for 15 minutes? And the answer to that is, yes. Bye. <laughs>